Hi everyone, I'm Anthony Pastore. Welcome to UBS Trending. Glad you're with us here today. The calendar year is winding down as we head for 2023, but there is no shortage of market activity, particularly within the energy space. Coming off of a weekend of OPEC meetings and looking to the future with things like renewables, for example, we ponder the state of the energy market next year and where there may be some opportunities for investors. Well, we couldn't think of being joined by a more capable person than my friend and colleague, Jay Dobson, U.S. Energy and Utilities Analyst with the Chief Investment Office. Jay, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Anthony, thanks for having me. It's always great to be back. A lot going on in the energy space. Anytime Absolutely. you sit here, that's, I think I always start the conversation that way because there always is. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> and activity, and, mm -hmm. and, and of course we had an, uh, at the uh, most recent weekend, there was an OPEC meeting over that weekend, yeah. so there was a lot of information and stuff that came out of that, but let me ask you about oil prices. We've seen quite a fluctuation, you know, the oil, we're looking at WTI crude, which is the benchmark, it peaked. Uh, earlier this year, and it is now down around you know, 90 bucks a barrel or so. Um, what are the expectations for oil and natural gas as you look to 2023, especially after a year of quite a lot of price fluctuation and volatility? Yeah, Anthony, it's a great question. It's one we're getting a lot right now. And I would tell you, by and large, markets are going to remain tight, and that will leave prices supported. Now, some of our viewers may say, what does tight mean? You know, supply and demand ultimately dictate the price of crude oil and really any commodity. So I'd say supply and demand are balanced. The challenge in 2023, as it is or was in 2022, is that demand is rising, and we expect that will continue in 2023. And so Supply is pretty limited, um, so you're basically going to have well-supported prices. Now, I would say the oil and the gas side is a little different, so let's take those in turn. On the oil side, look, we're expecting Chinese demand to recover in 2023, and that's the upside to demand. Yes, we'll be watching economic risks and the like in the EU, in the U.S., but demand seems sort of skewed to the upside. On the supply side, of course, you know, we've got the Russia issues, um, we've got OPEC, where essentially all of the spare capacity remains, um, and therein lies, I think, the balance of, of supply and demand. So I would say, you know, by and large, we're seeing sort of, you know, a balance of supply and demand, and, and prices, we think, will be, you know, over $100 at times in, in 2023. Uh, we'll also have to watch gasoline and diesel. Those markets remain very tight as well, and of course, as you and I have talked about before, those are the markets that uh, we all watch, because that's what we pay at the pump, and I expect prices will be here or slightly higher as we look out to 2023. And then on the natural gas side, you know, again, there'll be less Russian natural gas in, in 2023. Here in the U.S., we're a little protected from that, but I'd say, you know, oil, uh, sorry, gas prices in the 5 to $6 range, but they're going to be pretty volatile because they're more impacted by weather. So long answer to your question, but I'd say, you know, by and large, we're still going to have prices with risk to the upside for 2023 in oil and natural gas. Well, let's expand on that because it's a great way to get into the next part, which is, you know, looking at 2023, what are some of the risks to that forecast? Because as you said, the war in Ukraine is still going on. The European Union is poised to ban all imports of uh, Russian seaborne crude uh, this week, as a matter of fact, which could impact the uh, global supply chain. Um, economic growth also a factor. We're looking at inflation as, a, you know, what's going on in, in the movements there, what the Fed might do. Although we sort of have an indication China may be starting to open up a little bit more. There are so many other factors. Yeah. So is there some kind of risk to that forecast you just talked about? Yeah, it's a great question, Anthony. And like any forecast, there are many risks to it. I would say, by and large, as I frame them, the risks to price remain to the upside. That's because, again, as I was talking before, demand looks risks to the upside and supply looks risk to the downside. Um, now, again, oil and gas are a little different. Um, but as you said, weather, that's going to impact natural gas, but will impact oil as well, um, mm -hmm. you know, particularly given the price of natural gas in Europe, you'll actually see see some, you know, oil for gas switching. Um, so, but I, I would say the risks are weather, economics, and then ultimately some of these policies you talked about, you know, the Russian oil embargo and, and others. Um, but I, I'd say those are primarily the risks. We'll certainly be watching economies uh, in the developed world, the EU and the U.S., because I think that's probably where the challenge is, if there are going to be any on demand, uh, China likely offsetting that. But that's sort of, mm -hmm. sort of how we think about it. But you're exactly right. Look, no forecast is perfect. Uh, what we do see from where prices are right now, more likely higher prices 
raised and lower prices. Every year when the CIO releases the year ahead report, I think we all kind of hold our breath <laughs> because it just seems like immediately something changes. Of right. course, we can go back to the 2019 release and the next thing you know, we had a global pandemic that no one could predict. But certainly at least we understand, like you just talked about the factors. There's the upside and downside scenarios and at least we're talking about what those might be. So with OPEC over the meeting, as we just mentioned, there is the oil embargo from the European Union on Russian oil that took effect on December 5th. Um, and then you've got the meeting over the weekend where OPEC made a lot of pronouncements. How do these actually fit into your 2023 outlook or do they matter that much? Yeah, it really matter. Probably Russian oil embargo, a little more than OPEC, but I don't want to minimize OPEC. So mm -hmm. let's take them in turn. As you pointed out on Sunday, December 4th, OPEC plus met. They maintained their production unchanged. Um, so that's essentially what was expected. Um, but I think people have to keep in mind, OPEC Plus now is the marginal supplier of crude. Um, so they will be the one to balance the market. You know, mm -hmm. five years ago, that was the United States. We're not in that position anymore. Uh, so by and large, it's going to be OPEC Plus that increases supply or decreases supply to balance the market, which then says, where's the uncertainty? And that's in the EU's oil embargo of, of Russia crude. That's effective today, December 5th, and in all likelihood, we're going to see some disruption of Russian supply. Now, we don't know how much that's going to be, and I would at least suggest, I'm not sure anybody really knows what's going to happen. I think that did inform part of OPEC's decision over the weekend to hold supply unchanged, but I do think you're going to see, because what the embargo really means is that supply of oil that was going to Russia on ships, sorry, going to the EU on ships can no longer go there mm -hmm. and it has to go elsewhere. You know, Asia is likely the place you'll see that, but will all of that go to Asia? That's the uncertainty. Our bet is not all of it, but a lot of it. We need to keep in mind, though, uh, that was today, December 5th. On February 5th, there's a product embargo. So that means diesel and gasoline. We think that'll have actually a bigger impact because there's not likely a big demand in Asia for that refined product. So that'll be harder to find a new home for. Uh, and that'll create some additional disruption in Russian oil supply. Yeah. A lot to keep an eye on there, Jay, uh, as you just said. Um, and as we saw, the, uh, OPEC did say they were going to stick to their existing policy of reducing oil uh, production by 2 million barrels a day. So they didn't make any changes there no over the weekend. No changes at all. Right. Yes, exactly. So it remains, as they had said in uh, October, effective November, they reduced production 2 million barrels. That's really 1 million barrels because a lot of the members are not meeting their production quotas. Mm -hmm. But it says where we are right now, production is unchanged. Got it. All right, Jay, well, that brings us to a really interesting point then, because as we're talking, you're, one of your expectations is that oil prices, crude oil, could go to around $100 a barrel from where it is now. Gas prices at the pump might go a little higher. So is that a case for energy renewables then, which we've talked about on this show many times? As the price of crude oil and crude supplies go higher, is that a case for renewable sources? Yeah, no, Anthony, you're exactly right. It really gets to the heart of the energy transition. And higher prices, ultimately, for, for traditional energy, will accelerate that energy transition. What I'd love everyone to remember, really, if they remember anything from this discussion, is the energy transition is going to be really complicated. We're not investing enough in renewables, and we're not investing enough in fossil fuels. And we have to do more of both. And quite frankly, that will accelerate the transition. And I know it's a little counterintuitive, but the reality is that's what we need to do. We're burning more coal globally because there's a shortage of energy supply in the world. Uh, we can counteract that by finding better ways to burn more natural gas and then grow our renewables. So, yes, I do think what's happening right now will accelerate the energy transition. But, man, there's going to be fits and starts. Part of that fit and start is going to create the volatility in oil and natural gas or certainly feed it that we were talking about a moment ago. And as we We've had in previous discussions right here at this table, Jay. It is a complicated topic yeah. because it's not just switching off one and switching on another. They have to kind of work in concert with each other, like you said, to transition. And for our, our audience out there, if you look back at some of our previous shows, look for the ones that Jay and I have done on this particular topic uh, to kind of have a little bit more color on the energy transition and how that works. It's, but it's a great topic and something we'll be talking about for a long time. All right, so before I let you go, Jay, as we're looking towards 2023, what are your investment recommendations for investors who want to get into the energy space. Where are you telling them to go right now? 
Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, uh, Anthony, because looking out to 2023, it is going to be a bit of a challenging market, as we published, you were just mentioning, mm -hmm. you know, our year ahead and, and house view. Um, we certainly think the first six months of 2023 are going to be challenging. So it does leave us overweight energy. Now, again, some of our viewers may say, wow, that's a little kind of counterintuitive. You know, energy is sort of cyclical. The reality is in this tight environment that, quite frankly, a slowing economy in the U.S. and the EU, if China is accelerating, is not really going to do very much to impact so that tight environment will remain high prices will remain and let's face it even at $80 crude you know most of the US energy companies are, are uh, having pretty good free cash flow mm -hmm. and in the capital discipline environment we're in we see that coming back to shareholders in the form of dividends and, and share repurchases so we like the integrated oil companies we like the exploration and production companies we like the oil field services companies in addition to that uh, and we're overweight energy uh, I would say own the the utility companies. Uh, utility companies are defensive, so they'll help you out in that, you know, sort of more difficult environment we see at least in the first six months of 2023. But perhaps more importantly, I think utilities remained an under underappreciated way to play the energy transition. These are the companies, certainly here in the U.S., spending a lot of investment on wind and solar and renewables to enhance that transition or, dare I say, accelerate that transition to a lower carbon uh, energy supply. Great. Jay, thank you very much. And I know that within the year ahead, which is titled A Year of Inflections, energy, healthcare, and consumer staples um, are some of your preferred sectors from the CIO. And since they have been outperforming, it'll be uh, looking to see how they continue to grow in the, in the new year. So, Jay, thank you. I love when you come by because there's always something interesting and great takeaways for us and our audience to, uh, to get from you. So thanks for doing that, Jay. Good to see you. No, great seeing you. Thanks for the time. Hope to come back soon. I hope so, too. Make time for us, Jay. We Absolutely. love having you here. Great. And thank you all for joining us as well. There's a lot of information available for you right now and access to that brand new Year Ahead report entitled Year Ahead, uh, Year of Inflections. Here's the website, ubs.com forward slash year ahead, all one word, hyphen exclusive. It's right there on your screen. So make sure to check that out for all the content that Jay and I were just talking about, plus a lot of other information from the Chief Investment Office. And make sure to follow UBS on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, plus all of our past UBS trending episodes, including all the ones I've done with Jay, which I would recommend you take a look at. It's great stuff there. Um, is available on demand. And as always, if you have any questions about your own portfolio, make sure to speak with your financial advisor. Until next time, I'm Anthony Pastore. We hope you have a fantastic day. And remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon.